It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Good morning and happy Sabbath to happy Sabbath morning to the regular members and visitors. Um, do we have any visitors in the congregation today? No? Hello, can I get your name? If you don't mind. Sorry, could you repeat that? Carmela. Oh, Pamela. Hello. Nice to meet you. Thank you for choosing Croydon to worship today. I hope you are blessed, and I hope those online as well are blessed with today's service. Thank you. Um, so as we journey toward the end of May, um, it is my hope that we have uh, made plans, created plans, and put those plans in motion. Um, and I pray uh, things are working together for our good. So in the study today, um, uh, it is my hope that we can share what we have learned from the study of Abraham um, and Genesis in general. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us today to your house to worship and to praise you, Lord. Um, I pray that you are with us in the study um, and in the service. I pray that it is a fruitful discussion. Um, I pray that we learn many things, Lord. Um, and I pray just that you are with us um, and it, it's all for your glory. In your precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Diane. And good morning, one and all. Good morning to our Croydon members and visitors that are in the sanctuary today, and a good morning to those that are joining us online. This is Croydon Sabbath School panel coming out to you live. Today is the 21st of May. It's two minutes past 10 BST, unless you are watching on Catch Up. This is an interactive Bible study, and we want to hear from you in the usual way, whether you are in the church or whether you are in the comfort of your home or whether you are tuning in from another location if you are live we want to hear from you today um, and a good morning to those joining us on life radio this morning likewise we want to hear from you you know how to get in touch if you're tuning in on youtube or live stream you just send in your comments your questions in the chat in the usual way if you're joining us on Life Radio, you can get in touch via your email, which is studio at liferadio.uk. That's studio at liferadio.uk. And your WhatsApp number is 0731140409409. If you don't have a quarterly or a study guide, you'll see a link that will come up on the website for those of you that are looking on the screen where you can download a copy. But the way we do the lesson, you'll be able to follow and join in anyway. As usual, it's a team event. And so let me just say good morning to our senior and resident pastor, Pastor Royston Smith. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Elder Johnny. Um, it's nice to be here. I mean, last week we had a wonderful time, didn't we? Indeed. And, um, you know, it was nice to hear more of our members just coming in and chipping in with their thoughts and their ideas. And um, I'm sure we are ready to discuss about this concept of the promise, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about it. And um, let me just welcome a very good friend of mine, um, Elder Johnny, you might, you might not know this, but um, Sister Pam Witta Smith, Smith is her married name. Um, was um, the executive secretary for the president when I was um, only um, 21 years old in West Indies College. And um, now NCU, she looks as young as she was. So Absolutely. welcome to Croydon, and we hope you'll be blessed. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. So we have a visitor, and we have other visitors as well. You too are welcome in the church to give your comments. We have a couple of panelists online in the usual way. Let me say good morning to Sister Sharon Douglas. Good morning, Sharon. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's great to be with you all. Amen. And we have a brand new panelist, but it's somebody whose face and voice you may recognize. He's now in the panelist's chair. Good morning to Brother Pierre. 
Good morning, Ella Johnny. Happy Sabbath to you all. Wonderful. Okay, so we want to dig in to God's Word. But before that, we do that, we want to invite Pastor to just pray one more time for the Lord's presence to be with us as we open His Word. Lord, um, we come to dig into Your Word. But if just digging, it's not just about digging into Your Word, it's about learning from Your Word. It's not just about learning, but it's about applying and the application comes through living. So, today, may just one thought be shared that will transform and will change my life and the lives of those who are watching and listening and those who are sitting in Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bless Elder Johnny as he leads this discussion with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So we're at lesson number eight in the study of the book of Genesis. And today we're looking at the promise. When you think we studied the covenant, so we're looking at the promise. Um, our memory verse comes to us today from Genesis 24, verse 1. And we have a member of our congregation, Sister Levy, that's going to share the memory verse for us. Good morning, Sister Levy. Good morning, Elder Johnny. Today's memory text is taken from Genesis chapter 24, verse 1. And it reads, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Amen. 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 We're going to dig into that a little later on, or learn from it, as Pastor is saying, a little later on. So, Pastor, you seems like you're under scrutiny today with your, your visiting uh, guest here with us. However, you know, as a former teacher, um, you may have held unexpected or, or, or shock tests on pupils like God did with Abraham. But this, I think you may have used as a measure of knowing how much knowledge may have been ingrained in your students at that time. So, thinking about this, this, you know, this unexpected test, what does this tell you about always being ready for life's examinations? <laughs> Are you, are you trying to get my former students to, to, to dislike me, Elder John? <laughs> I, I, the thing, and I'm sure I can see smiles on the faces of the members who are here. Elder Fibian is smiling because now his mind goes back to when he failed that test because he wasn't ready for it. I mean, the thought is that um, as a teacher, I love when my students are ready. Um, I, had a, I had a professor um, and um, his name, I don't want to call. That's right. Um, but he used to do, just do that. You go into class and he says, right, get your paper out, it's this. And I'm like, for crying out loud, we have just had lunch at the cafeteria in West Indies College and, you know, a lot of sugar content. We're about to fall asleep. We're going to give us a test you didn't tell us. And he would say to us, you must always be ready. And you kind of think about life as a Christian that we are one step away from death, mm. one step away. You and I, we don't know what's going to happen the moment we step off this stage. Anything, anything can happen. So as, as children of God, we must always be ready. We must always be ready. Always be ready. Mm. And by the way, Lejoni, I never gave a snap test. Okay. I was a very, very good teacher. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> So the bottom line, what Pastor's saying there, is that we must always be ready. Do you agree with what Pastor Royston has said? What does God's sudden test of Abraham tell you about being always ready for life's examinations? Let's have your thoughts, comments, answers to that particular question, whether you are listening, uh, viewing remotely, or whether you're in the church this morning. So, many sermons have been preached on Genesis chapter 22, um, but we're going to focus on the main features that were brought out in the lesson this morning. So, Sister Sharon, coming to you first of all, can you share for us what happens in Genesis 22 verses 1 through to 6, please? 
You're just on mute, Sharon. This is it. We want to hear the dulcet tones, please. Apologies. That's OK. I, I should be reading from the New King James Version, um, Genesis 22, 1 to 6. And it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. So about 20 years had passed between chapters 21 and chapter 22. And you can imagine the blessing Isaac had been to his parents and true to his name had brought laughter and happiness to their lives. Now, like a bolt from heaven, God instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son. You could say that this was the greatest test that could come to God-fearing parents. If we put ourselves in Abraham's sandals, we would be asking, God, why would you instruct me to give up my son after Sarah and I waited so long to have him? And what about your promise? You promised that the Messiah would come through Isaac's lineage. How can this happen now? God's command to Isaac really just didn't make any sense at all. But Abraham knew the voice of God because he had spoken to God on a number of occasions. When you think about the fact that we struggle when God tells us to do something that's right, but to do something that's wrong and then says, God told me to, I can only think if anyone had heard uh, that being said in our day and age, the response would be, yeah, right. The sacrifice of human beings was common in ancient times. However, this was something God had forbidden. Nevertheless, Abraham did not question this. In calling Isaac Abraham's holy, holy son, God was pointing out that he alone was considered the legitimate heir of the promise mm. and was greatly loved by Sarah and um, Abraham. This contrasts with God calling Ishmael, the son of a bond woman, in Genesis 21, 12 and 13. So Abraham acted without delay, without questioning. He did not refer to Sarah or seek human counsel. Abraham was calm and steady on the outside, but no doubt trembling on the inside. You know, one can imagine that as they traveled, that Abraham was silently praying while Isaac was puzzled as to, mm. you know, saw no sign in terms of what was going to be sacrificed. Although Abraham did not understand God's purpose, he did believe that he would raise Isaac from the dead, for God had promised that Isaac would be his heir, and Abraham trusted in the promises of God. Amen. So in faith, he said to his servants that he and Isaac were going to worship and would return to them. Yes. This was the height of his spiritual experience, and it was evident not only in his unwavering obedience, but also in his unflinching faith in God's unfailing promises. Amen. While Abraham is fully prepared to offer Isaac, he also is confident that God will raise him. Here is obedient faith in action. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. Powerful. Um, let's continue. As I said, everybody knows the story, but let's continue. Brother Pierre, verses 7 through to 10, 12, please, and tell us the meaning of this test in your eyes. Thank you, Elijani. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, 
And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb mm -hmm. for a burnt offering. So the two, of, the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Mm. Uh, a little journey, when we consider those verses, we can see an open communication between a father and a son. I would, I would say it's a very sincere communication. Besides being a father, I can feel that Abraham is like a mentor to his son Isaac because he has lived his faith in God before Isaac. And Isaac himself has been able to witness the trust Abraham has in God. Isaac, like Jesus, is obedient to the point of death, as referenced in Philippians 2 verse 8. Abraham trusted God and his plan, and he was willing to slay his son. His only begotten, as said God, knowing by faith God, a promise keeper, was able to raise Isaac from the dead. Mm. I am amazed by God's timing. God's timing, God's promises are always just on time. Right. I mean, if the angel of the Lord was distracted a bit and Isaac could have been dead. But the right timing, the angel of the Lord, meaning God himself, intervened mm. just at the right time. By this test, God wanted Abraham to know about his love for humanity and his willingness to save them at any cost by the gift of his only begotten son, Jesus. Abraham succeeded, satisfied God's expectation, in the test. Amen. Amen. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Sharon, I, I like what you said, that Abraham knew the voice of God. Is there anything you want to come back on in terms of the rest of the story there? Um, let's hear you, please, Sharon. Let's hear you, please. Apologies. Um, right, can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. Okay, all right. All I wanted to say that by his actions, Abraham showed that his love for Isaac was not greater than his love for God, who gave him his son in the first place. Often God puts our faith to the test. Um, he tests our faith not for his benefit. He already knows exactly how strong or weak our faith is. No test. Um, so, no, God tests our faith for our benefit. Um, and just to say that, you know, for that reason, sometimes God allows things to happen that are difficult. Sometimes we are confronted with a situation that seems to make no sense at all. Yes. But God promises to use each of these situations as an opportunity for us to fear, love, and especially trust in him above all things. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, panelists. Pastor, what's coming in, please? Um, Alana says it's about total dependency, talking about readiness. Yes. Um, Brother Omega says, test because he loves and he wants us to grow in grace. I like the concept of linking um, tests and growing in grace. It's kind of a, a bit of an oomph there, Elder Johnny, mm. in our view, is tests and growing in faith. Um, Patrice says, our decisions can change. I like this, the course of history. So, so be ready. P powerful point there. Rodney says, Lot, Lot, Lot was tested last week. Now Abraham is this week. He says, faith against faith. I'm thinking that we all will face some tests at some point. Um, Nigel says, be ready. Akusa says, always be ready because our lives reflect, should reflect God and we are always witnesses of God. Um, Erlene Samuel says, we know not the hour. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the church saying, of the masters, mm. 
Eternal. appearing. Um, F. Allen says, great example of, of faithfulness. And we know the song, Great is Thy, O Lord my. It's about faith, Elder John, putting mm -hmm. your faith and trust in God. Tom, Tom is a bit more philosophical. He says, I, I, I don't think God tested Abraham. I think God examined him. Mm -hmm. But I want him to expand on that because there's no difference between testing and examining. I think it's, one, it's a matter of semantics, but I'm sure he's going to come back with some theological concept. Now, here's our controversial um, um, former, co former host who will be coming back soon, David Billet. He says, for Abraham, Isaac was never going to, be, to die based on faith in his God. Also, Isaac knew that his father was never going to kill him. Mm. Abraham had passed on the gift of faith to his son. Mm. Listen, so why did he take the knife? Uh, El Elder Villette, why did he take the knife? Why was he ready to commit the deed? Come back on that one. Um, over there in, um, in, in Spain, our sister Bailey Thompson says, live every day as though it could be your last, because one day it will be. Psalm 92 says, so teach us to number our days. Mm. And I hear the church say, so that we may apply our hearts to what? Wisdom. To wisdom. So Abraham, is, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham in type received his son back from the dead. Um, Statue of the Lord made powerful point because um, um, Isaac could not have died for our sins. Isaac was a type of Christ. Yep. Th think about that. Um, F. Allen says, and, and this is a bit a sad one, he says, this year I lost a child and almost died myself from a ruptured atopic pregnancy. Mm. Yes, God does allow things to happen. I'm thankful, not sorrowful, because of my faith in him. Amen. Can we have a prayer for F. Allen, Elder Johnny? Of course. Just of let course. me pray. Father, Go ahead. Father, we thank you for, for, um, we thank you for love and, and, and energy and life. We put F. Allen, who is online at this time, who experienced loss, loss of a child. And amidst the grief, that she's experiencing or he's experiencing. Um, he's very thankful for your faith, for your grace and your mercy. Reach out to all those who have lost and all those who are losing and remind them that in the sweet by and by, you will raise all those of us who have died and those who are alive will be caught up. So reach out in faith to F. Ali now we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Over. Pastor. Thank you. I think we have a member of our congregation that's going to share a point. Good morning, Brother Les. Good morning, um, Brother Johnny. Um, I just really wanted to um, stress on something which I found quite interesting. Because in verse 2, it is clear that God said to Abraham that Isaac was to be the sacrifice. Later on, when they reached um, the mountain, he said to his servants, the lad and I will go and we, plural, will return. So that was clear to me there that God has said to him, Isaac's going to be sacrificed, and if the two of them are going up, why is he saying we? Because you would have thought I would return. So it's clear to me there that not only did he say we believe in that, even if um, Isaac was to be the sacrifice, as we read in Romans, I believe, that he would raise him again, but also Isaac was obedient and willing to be a sacrifice as well. And I think what that teaches is that there's no sacrifice too precious for God. Amen. Amen. Great right point. On. Thank you for sharing that. So keep your thoughts and points coming in, whether you're in the congregation in church or whether you are online. Let me go out there with another question to you. What do we learn about the relationship of Abraham and Isaac and the character of Isaac from this event. It's been touched on, but just think about it. What do we actually learn? Just a bit more in terms of the relationship between father and son, Abraham and Isaac, and the character of Isaac himself. Let's hear your thoughts on that. In the meantime, Abraham told himself, sorry, in the meantime, Abraham told Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. And Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, and God did. So, Brother Pierre, John 1, verses 1 to 3, that famous promise, help us understand, and help us to understand possibly even more than Abraham did. Help us to understand 
the words that he said in line with the uh, Lord's promise. John 1, verses 1 to 3, please. Thank you, Lord Johnny. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, John chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Uh, that passage uh, clearly states that Jesus is God and the same likeness of the Father. Now, provided the fact that Abraham said, the Lord will provide, if we go to the word that was used there, is the Lord would provide himself. God is not providing anything but his grace, but himself. Mm. Now, we are in the situation of a, what we will call a sacrifice of substitution. A sacrifice of substitution. Isaac was going to be sacrificed, but the Lord provided a ram. The, that, that lamb, quoted by John, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So by faith, under the influence, I would say, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Abraham proclaimed God's grace, God's mercy, God's love. And he claimed for himself and for Isaac the sacrifice of substitution. Mm. Of course, in John 3, 16, we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In 1 Peter 2, 24, Jesus bore our sins so that we can live a righteous life, a righteous life. Echoed with Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was wounded for our transgression. By his stripes, we were healed. So God provided Jesus to be our substitute. Jehovah Jireh means that God provided himself to make atonement, cleansing for our sins. Mm. Jesus, in John 8, 56, would say that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Mm. We can trust God with our lives, mm. for he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen, amen, thank you. Obviously not the Lord's promise, although an important promise from the Lord. Just before I take um, a comment from the congregation, Sister Sharon, let me just come to you in the same way. Um, how do we link back to what happened on Mount Moriah with what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, verses 6 through to 8, please? Okay, and again, reading from the New King James Version, and it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love um, towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And, you know, we can know a later story where a son climbs a hill, but this time there is no voice from heaven. Mm. And the father does not stop. The place is now called Calvary. And similar to what Brother Peer was saying, so Abraham and Isaac reenacted something that would take place a millennium later on the same hill in which Abraham nearly sacrificed his son, Jesus died for our sins. And so it points to God's plan of salvation for mankind. In this same way that Abraham is tested, God also faced the ultimate test in sacrificing his only son for us. Abraham received a free pass by substitute ram sacrifice, but God did not provide a substitute for his own beloved son. Jesus was the substitute sacrifice for us, the perfect lamb of God. However, it also reveals how God tests his children. Our testing will not involve anything quite as dramatic, but it will be difficult because a test is not a true test unless it's hard for us. Mm -hmm. So God has a funny way of being able to locate where our loyalties lie. And if we want to commit to him and go all the way, we often have to give up something 
we've put on the same pedestal as the Lord. This, of course, won't mean sacrificing our children, but it might mean giving up idolizing something, even a good thing, to focus more on our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Good point. Thank you. Pastor, just before I come to you, let me just take a comment from our congregation. Sister Levy. The question was about um, the relationship between Isaac and his father. First of all, the spirit of prophecy says Isaac was a godly child. Isaac depended on his father um, for teaching and reliability. Abraham taught Isaac to trust in God. Uh, he taught him um, that God was the creator, it was God who was in control, and it was wise, it was wisdom to worship and to do what God asked. And for, as we go on, I don't want to jump ahead, but as we go on into the lesson further, I, I would just like to say, I mean, how many young men nowadays would trust their father to go and choose a wife? Mm -hmm. For them. We'll come to that. We'll yes, to I said that. I don't want to jump, jump that. And, he, and, 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 and don't forget that Isaac stayed at home until he was 40. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So there was, a, there was a bond, a special bond between both father and son because he had been taught as a child to put his trust in the Almighty. And, then, and that cemented that relationship between him and his father. Amen. Thank you very much. I believe we have another comment from the congregation before I come to you, Pastor. When we think about Abraham and Isaac, we could see that his total trust and love between Abraham and Isaac. Isaac would do anything that his dad tell him to do. And I could understand when Jesus gave his only son, it was total trust, unity, and love with them why God did that. Yes. My Paul, when Paul was a little boy, and I go to work, and I come in from work, don't care what I have in my hand, I have to drop it. For Paul will jump from the top of the stairs into my arms, mm. and I have to prepare to catch him when he comes. Mm. And that was total love, it was total trust, and it was total confidence he had in me. And I love him, mm. that I couldn't allow him mm. to fall, so I have to catch him. Mm. I remember we had the same thing with Aaron, and Aaron was a bit naughty and he'd go on a flat roof we have out there. And Paul was standing. And Aaron knew that I come in. And he knew that I would chastise him when I come, if I find him on it. And he didn't know what to do. He climbed through the window. And Paul stand up down there. And Paul said to him, jump, Aaron, jump. And Aaron jumped. And Paul catch him. And I'm saying this to show the love that Jesus had for us is more than any tongue mm. can tell. Mm. No man cannot explain that love fully. Mm. But all we can say that God loves us and he gave, Jesus gave his life for us. Amen. And I would give my life to save my son. Amen. Powerful testimony. Ter powerful. I don't know what it is about your sons, Brother Simpson, wanting to jump from high places, but obviously it's about the faith, knowing that you will catch them. Powerful testimony. Thank you very much. Pastor. I was looking to see if Paul, a little bit of tear was coming from <laughs> Paul's eyes, you know. Um, I, hope, I hope Aaron is listening to, to see how much his, his father really, truly care about him and how much his father really really love him amen and um as small as brother brother um simpson is he's as strong as a lion mm. thank you brother brother for that powerful testimony i'm um, elder johnny and that's what is coming through online alana makes the point about isaac being 
a child which has a sense of purity. She is like a prototype of Christ. Nigel talks about the relation between God and, and between God and Jesus. Just looking at um, Isaac, Abraham, God, Jesus. That um, Abraham was willing to put Isaac on the line, and God, you know, the Father put Jesus, the Son, on the line. CC talks about the relationship. Akusa talks about the bond of trust and relationship, and Pastor Andre Malcolm over there in Jamaica, who's my mother's pastor, where he was. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about the same kind of relationship. Donna Davis talks about that. Rodney talks about faith. Elizabeth Clark talks about the trust and the bond. And I knew that David Billet would come back, so he has come back. And um, he made this point, if I can find it, Elder Johnny, um, all right, Elder David, can you type the point you made a while ago? So that, because the point you made is the point that you were making. Um, I might have misquoted you. Um, Rodney, Smith, Rod, Rodney Smith says, God has a line of people who, who, who made up his remnant church from the very beginning. The sacrifice of, Stella says, the sacrifice of, of Isaac really happened through the substitute ram as his action of being ready to die was for God and, and evidence of his allegiance to him. Mm -hmm. Nigel, Nigel Archer said, we need to teach our children to be living sacrifice yes. unto God. This will not happen by chance. Abraham ordered his household after him. The secret of teaching our children is to live and die for God. Mm. And this is another point that is coming through. Um, and Brother, Brother Simpson, Maria Reed says, wonderful testimony. Brother Simpson, God bless you. But here's the point, and the text says, God himself will provide a lamb. Mm -hmm. Notice, God himself. That's right. Do you know, it's, it's, it's what we call a reflective pronoun, right? God himself. He didn't say Abraham was going to provide. He says, God himself will provide a lamb. Abraham took a lamb in the form of Isaac, but the Bible says that God himself is it saying that God was going to give Abraham a lamb, or is it that God himself was going to be that lamb? We need to probably dig into the text more. God himself will be that lamb, and that I, is coming through. I was going to say, I think we know the answer, because it was prophetic as well as uh, for that time. Exactly. And, and, and that's the point. And, and Abraham, as I was saying, he probably he wouldn't have fully understood what was going on at that time. But again, as was said, because of his faith and his trust in God. And so that phrase, God himself, is talking about the now and it's talking about the future But, but well. then, But then you go back, Elder Johnny, to the point about the, 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 the two lessons before, um, the roots of Abraham. Mm. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the sticking point of the entire lesson. Mm. The root, Abraham's root was not his genealogy, it wasn't his, the wealth that he has because he was a wealthy man. Um, it, the root of Abraham is the faith That's right. that, he, that he had in God. And, and I think, I think when we, when we, if, we can, if we can drill ourselves down in that faith, um, if we can just together, that's why the Bible says, if our faith is as small as a what? Mustard seed. Mustard seed. I think we, we don't get, we don't, we don't achieve because our faith is not as strong as it should be. Indeed, indeed. And my faith in time is not as strong as it should be because time is always against us. So keep your thoughts coming in. If you're tuning in on the radio, this is Croydon Sabbath School panel going out to you live. We want to hear from you as well. Let me go out with another question to our congregation and those listening in. In these days of looking after number one and encouraged self-sufficiency, how would you communicate Christ's atonement and the need for forgiveness to those who don't see the need. So in other words, those people who feel, yeah, yeah, it's all right, I can sort myself out. How do you communicate the need of Christ's atonement and, 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 and forgiveness for those who feel they don't need it? So it's a deep one. Let's hear your thoughts on that one. While you're thinking that through, chapter 23 of Genesis opens with the sad news of Sarah, Abraham's wife, dying at the ripe old age of 127 years. The rest of the chapter speaks about Abraham making funeral arrangements, as it were. So, Sister Sharon, you know, what stands out for you about the inclusion of, of, of this narrative there in, in, in chapter 23? Okay, so, um, yeah, Sarah is the only woman whose age is mentioned in the um, scripture. And as faithful as Esther, Ruth, 
in the whole Old Testament and, you know, Jesus' mother, Mary, was in the New Testament, we are not ever explicitly told to look to them as examples of faith. But Hebrews 11, 11 mentions Sarah as one who died in faith. And then we have the lengthy business transaction that takes place between um, Abraham and Ephraim. And um, it's significant because of its place in the overall story of Abraham, who has been following God to the land God promised to give him and his descendants. Now, as Abraham's life draws towards its close, he will finally come to own his first and only piece of the actual promised land. Though this little burial plot for Sarah is all Abraham will ever personally own of the promised land, his willingness Insistence on purchasing a piece of it to bury his wife speaks volumes concerning Abraham's faith in God. Abraham will not run home to bury Sarah in the old family cemetery, nor will Abraham be content to be given a place in Canaan to bury her, though the people of the land were as swift to offer him a free place to um, bury her. But a free burial plot would mean a temporary arrangement and Abraham is convinced his descendants are here for the long haul. Mm. So Abraham makes an investment in the promised land. He buys a place to bury his beloved wife, trusting that God will one day give their family all this land. Not only Sarah, but Abraham himself will be buried in this place, mm. and Isaac and Rebecca mm. and Jacob and there. And it is significant that Joseph also asks that his bones are not left in Egypt, but that it's taken to Canaan. This all speaks of faith, faith that God will one day fulfill all his promises to his people. Abraham was willing to pay whatever it, um, it was quoted um, as a price for the land. For him, this is sure, safe investment. The question to us is, do we invest our every resource as if God's word will certainly come to pass or do we hedge our bets? Oh, that is so deep. Thank you so much, Sister Sharon. Elder Pierre, I, I think Sharon has said so much, but anything you want to add to uh, what Sharon just said there? Well, uh, she said all. <laughs> there you go. Wow, powerful. So let's hear from yourself. Um, Pastor, I asked a question about looking after number one and self-sufficiency. I don't know if you've had any comments coming in online about that as yet? Uh, not as yet. I mean, I mean, Sharon has stunned the whole um, church and mm. online audience and mm. nobody's saying anything mm. at all. <laughs> and for once, Elder Pierre has no comeback on that point, which is quite amazing. Um, but, but here's something that is coming through, and it's about child sacrifice. And, um, bear in mind, um, somebody saying, if God asks you to, to, to take your old, only child and sacrifice that only child, would you do that? Um, but if you dig, drill down into Scripture, remember that God was already against child sacrifice. Right. So right through Scriptures, you know, it, it was, I mean, God, God actually chastised Israelites. Um, when they became friendly with the other nations around them that were practicing that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So let us be very clear online and in church that, um, that God has never endorsed, nor has the Bible ever endorsed child sacrifice. Right. Um, that is why it was God testing or examining um, the faith of Abraham. That is why God himself stopped um, Abraham from committing such an atrocity, which he totally abhor, which he totally says should never, never, should never have happened. So just to respond to that line, that God does not allow, he never, he never permits it, and it's not in, it's a biblical, it's, it's, it's anti-God, mm. anti-Bible, and it should not be allowed, nor should it be accepted. Amen. So that's something that we need to be, we need to be shared. But here's a point. Rodney saying that Isaac was, was to be a burnt offering, not a sin offering. Only Jesus could die for our sins. We, we, we already, we're quite, I think we're quite afraid to that. Um, the most effective way, here we go, um, somebody's responding. Um, when Brother Omega said, the most effective way to communicate the love and forgiveness of God, which is found in Jesus Christ, is to live a loving, forgiving, and caring life. We must walk, we must walk and talk. We must be a walking talking, teaching sermon. 
Mm. I'm going to borrow this from my ser sermon today. So <laughs> if you hear that come out, it wasn't me, it, was, uh, it wasn't me, it was Elder, um, Brother Amwenga. Here we go. Elaine James says, whatever we may think as ours, we have, but through, but through knowing God, trusting him, we can, we, can have, we, can, we, can, we can have all we need. Richard Chilendi says, Abram brought burial site for his wife. The lesson learned here is that as Christians, we should not beg for free things from the underprivileged or use our position to get whatever we want. That's a good point. Mm. You know, mm. if you can afford it, pay for it. Mm. Um, don't, don't take what you don't need. Mm. Uh, give to others. Um, Dawit says, um, 1 Corinthians 5 says, Christ's sacrifice signifies almost all the symbols of the Old Testament offering. Burn, sing, peace, even the red heifer, not only sin offering. There, there we go. Thanks for that point. Right. Over to Elder Johnny. Great point. Thank you. I think we've got a comment coming in from our congregation. Yes, it's Sister Rose. Good morning to you, Sister Rose. Good morning. In answer to your question, we cannot tell people anything about God. We have to show people God. And so in order for us to teach people about forgiveness, God's forgiveness of our sin, we have to show them what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. And we have to show them the benefits of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at Isaac and Abraham's example, Isaac trusted Abraham because he saw that Abraham trusted God and the benefits of trusting God. And through his life, he saw the benefits of trusting his father, Abraham. Mm. And that is what showing people God is about. Yes. We have to live a life that show people that God has changed us. We have, to, we have to forgive people. We have to build relationships with people that they can trust. In this life now, people are self-reliant because time and time again, they have been let down yes. by others. And so people then withdraw into themselves. The only way to get people to start trusting is to show them that there is something that they can trust in that will not let them down. Mm -hmm. And so that is how you show people God. Mm -hmm. You can't tell them, you have to show them God. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So keep your thoughts um, coming in. Um, Elder Johnny. Go ahead, sir. So, so I, I don't know, what, is, is, is um, Sister Rose saying that it's not... It's not what you say is what you do. Is that what it, she's saying? Effectively, not... that's it. That's, that's it. It's not about paying lip service. It's about demonstrating what forgiveness really means. Are we together? I thought you were going to disagree with me. Good. Okay. Uh, I, I probably wasn't, but if you want me to, I can. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. Let, let, let's move on because time and me aren't friends at the moment. Now, um, let me go out with another question. Um, Hebrews 11 verse 11 says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive and deliver her child. So remembering Sarah's, Sarah's age now, where does this suggest the source of your strength should come from even in the twilight years? So let's hear your thoughts on where your strength should come from in the twilight years. A leading question, but we want to hear your testimonies. So as Sister Levy alluded to a little while earlier, like most parents, Abraham, now a single parent, wants a good wife for his son of promise. And so Abraham decides he cannot leave the choice of a daughter-in-law to Isaac. So Brother Pierre, who does Abraham commission? What does this tell us about the one commission and why this mission? Strange questions, I know. But if you, um, in Genesis 24, 1 to 10, summarize, we haven't got time to read that. But if you can just maybe summarize that story and just answer those questions for us, please. Thank you so much for the journey. From New Kingdom Version, I could quickly read Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that men should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And then Isaac is no different. Uh, we, we don't have time to read the story, well known, but let's say that we see in Abram a father 
that desires the best for his son, including a good wife, which is a gift from the Lord. The Lord himself created us with a void that a partner should be able to uh, gap. And Isaac at that moment, there was a time for everything, Ecclesiastes said. It was the time for Isaac to have a wife. And then the father is interested in that very important topic. But commissioning Eliezer of Damascus entice preparation of Eliezer. It, it entice trust in him and delegation of power. So it, it is really interesting as uh, you can trust someone with such crucial matter. Eliezer of Damascus indeed has learned to know and trust God through the examples of her master. He learned a life of obedience, humility, and service. This mission given to Eliezer was carried to secure God's promise to bless Abraham and his descendants, and through his seed, all the nations of the earth. As a faithful servant, Eliezer commit himself to respect and execute his master's plan, which was in reality God's. He also demonstrated that his master was in a very good situation for the wife to be. So Eliezer, compelling, being compelled by his master, took a journey of prayer and trust in God. Mm, okay, interesting. Just before I go to our congregation, um, Sharon, we just need to kind of summarize the rest of the story. Now, Eliezer is successful, but from his actions, what more do we learn from the rest of this chapter about the character of Eliezer, please? Okay, so we know that he um, showed faithfulness, um, as was said, you know, he set off on his um, journey and he was strategic when he got to his destination. You know, he positioned himself in a place where available ladies might pass by because in that culture, unattached maidens often visited the well to socialize with peers. Um, but the choice of Abraham's bride was beyond his decision-making capacity. So he needed help. So who better to ask than God? And as you've heard, he was a praying man. Mm. And I reckon that he started praying before he even got to his destination. He was praying through the journey um, there. And we see that, you know, it wasn't long before he finished praying that Rebecca arrived and fulfilled every requirement. You see, Eliezer did not just want um, any girl for um, Isaac. He wanted God's girl. That's right. So here we have her um, um, watering not only Eliezer, but the camels as well. And we probably know that camels, they take a lot of water, about 30 gallons of water for a short time in terms of just trying to quench their thirst. And she was quite, she was more than happy to um, fill her job on a number of occasions and fulfill that. So her actions went above and beyond the demands of hospitality and reflected both her kindness and her serving heart, which would have no doubt matched the type of characteristics needed for a bride um, for Isaac. Mm. So Eliezer prayed for success because he wanted to honor the task given to him by his master, Abraham. And on learning that Rebecca was a relative of his master, he doesn't forget that after prayer, there should be praise. Mm. He immediately bowed his head and worshipped God. He did not wait to hear her answer right. or and to put forward his proposal. He did not wait until every detail of the arrangement was worked out and he had safely delivered her across the barren desert. No, he recognised God's answer even before the answer was complete. Amen. And he praised him right there and then. Amen. And I just wanted to say, then on going to her home, meeting Abraham's family, and the proposed and the purpose of his journey being achieved, he again praised God mm -hmm. without delay. And with William and Rebecca, he returns home. Eliezer was patient in prayer. Mm -hmm. 
Patient allows us to hear God's voice yes. and not run ahead of him. Like Eliezer, we can boldly speak answers. Um, we can both boldly seek answers. We should never be afraid to ask for decisions. Lastly, let's not forget to praise him before and after he answers. Amen. On fire today, Sister Sharon. Thank you very much. Brother Pierre, just before I go to the congregation, anything you wanted to come back on from that? Yes, the journey. We want to see that Eliezer was trying to put before Abraham some obstacles or hindrances that might make the mission unsuccessful. And in verse 7, Abraham said, the Lord will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife. So the, Abraham led, led, led everything in the hands of the Lord. He had the thought, but he knew that it was going to be God's doing it. And actually, Eliezer thanked God for, for allowing him to be successful in his mission. Sometimes we have a thought. We can say, a thought came to me, but you are not the source of that thought. That's right. And you cannot fulfill it yourself. That's right. Great point. Thank you very much. Let's go to our congregation at this time. Good morning to you. I've forgotten your name. Just remind us of your name. Please. Yeah, my name is Maura. Maura. Good to see you, Maura. I come specifically to tell you this. Um, going on for what Sister Ross said. Um, it's about showing love, but not only love, compassion, and faithfulness, self-control, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, what it bothers me is um, how we treat our brothers and sisters from Islam. Ishmael was the firstborn. Yeah, it never to happen. We can't change what happened. We can change the future. Um, I don't think we treat Islam with respect and dignity because that is the love of God if we treat any human being and starting for ourselves with respect and dignity. So we won't do that to other people. We would, you know, God gives us a gift uh, of, he treats us with love and dignity and he respects our decisions. Um, we choose because he gave us to choose and if we chose wrong, he come and die for all our sins. That's right. That means he took responsibility for giving us free choice. So um, I want people to grow up and look at Islam. We worship the same God. You know, it's nobody's fault. It's, um, and we must show them the love of Christ. The, you know, it's, it's the love only with the power. We're so privileged, mm -hmm. Christians, because we have the love and the power of God within us, his Holy Spirit. We will achieve greater things. Jesus said that through us, we will achieve greater things. So if we are going to be available to God, uh, to do his will, we must activate this power within us because we will never accomplish anything if it's from ourselves, Thank in you. our sinful nature. Thank you very much. Great point. Thank you. Pastor. Um, um, Alana says, um, God is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Um, Brother Omengo said, then, then spake Jesus again as I'm saying, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall walk in light. And the concept of Jesus being our example. And what is coming through Elijah, um, and, and Deborah makes the point, uh, and Jennifer makes the point, that Eleazar was a praying man, and that he trusted God. Um, Rodney says, marriage requires a lot of prayer. Then he says, smile, Elder Johnny. Um, <laughs> I think he's saying, I must smile. Um, Jennifer's Eliezer prayer shows us to be specific in our prayer to God on what we need according to his will. Um, somebody bumped in a thought and says um, um, that, that um, uh, in our older age, we give up too quickly on having children. I don't... I, 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 just, I, I, just, I just had 
I just had to say that, Elder Charlie, to bring a smile on the faces of my members here. Um, yeah, when, when it's gone, it's gone. Um, <laughs> Rodney says, a good wife is not just found, but one who is carefully selected. And so is a good husband. Uh, you know, we need to select carefully. Um, um, but here's a thought, Elder Johnny. And if you go back in the text, Genesis 24, and when you have time, viewers, members, verse 12, O Lord God of my master, Eli Eli Eliezer, he was seeking divine um, guidance. When God gave him an answer in verse 25, he says, moreover, she says, we both straw enough. Here. Then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. He, he gave thanksgiving. Um, I, th I think um, Sharon made the point. But also when you go to verse 33, um, when they set food before him, he says, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. He was, he put, he was putting the mission before his mouth. That's right. You know, this is my purpose. Let it be accomplished. I will do nothing until that which God has sent me to do is revealed to myself. So it's coming through, Elder Johnny, that we need to be cautious and careful. Justice guy, just, 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 tennis guy says, we don't, why don't we continue the tradition of choosing a spouse for offspring if it was so godly effective in the Bible? Can we throw that out to our members? You really want to throw it? Okay. I, so I the, want question, to. the question going out there is, why don't we continue as parents to choose a spouse for our children? Although I think the question should be, why don't children allow their parents to influence their choice of a, a spouse? But, you know, I don't want to change that. That said, my one child that is married, thank the Lord, you know, I believe it was a God-led choice. If not, I'll sort him out. But um, we thank the Lord <laughs> I, for... Um, I wonder if you were influential in that conversation, Elder Johnny. I wouldn't possibly disclose private matters <laughs> yeah. um, on, on, in public. Okay, this, now, our, time, our time is rushing ahead from us. We've got a comment that's coming in from Sister Smith. Good morning to you, Sister Smith. Good morning, Elder Johnny. The question was asked a little while ago, where does the source of our strength come from, referring to Sarah? in our twilight years, and speaking from experience, the source of our strength in our twilight years is from the trials and victories God brought us through in our former years. When we have faith in him, when the trials come, and we just get on our knees and we pray, and God bring us through it, then you look back yes. when you get into your twilight years yes. and you say, well, God brought me through that yes. and he will bring me through this. Hey. That's, so that is what I wanted to say, really. If we, if we use our past experience yes. of victories and no matter what meets us now, we know God did it before and he will do it again. Hey, Amen. Powerful answer. I, I think Thank we have you Sister so Saul number two. That's in powerful. Sister. Sister Saul, number two, and Sister Smith there. Amen. Uh, Amen. But, but Elder Johnny, that actually came through. Sorry, you bumped me off with that question. Oh, about, go ahead, yeah. sorry. But go that ahead. came through about trials and difficulties. Yes. A lot of um, online viewers are saying um, it's the faith, it's the challenges of life, it's the resilience. Over time, you develop that strength, you know, you can go forward. But the key point that is coming through is the concept of faith. Amen. Amen. But I thought Sister um, Smith was going to answer the question about choosing a spouse. But anyway. <laughs> Pastor, you're too facetious. Let us, um, let us move on. So um, our focus um, on Abraham for this quarter ends with him getting married again to Keturah. So there is a kind of answer that even in your older age, Brother Pierre, so despite his age, he wasn't sitting back in a rocking chair, so to speak since he fathered six more sons. Is there a promise still being fulfilled here, would you say? Thank you, Elder Johnny. As we referred uh, previously to Genesis 2, 18, and the Lord said it's not good for that man should be alone, there seems to be no restrictions in terms of age uh, in this passage. So we, 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 we can understand it was a need uh, for Abraham to have another wife but I, I appreciate the sequence as the Bible present that. Wife for Isaac first, and then wife for Abraham. Given that Isaac was comforted by Rebekah, now it was time for 
uh, Abraham to come into, into the picture. Mm. Indeed, after Sarah's death, Isaac was comforted, as I said. Abraham needed a companion likewise, and a companion he found in Keturah. Not much is said about Keturah. We, we don't know about her father, her mother. Well, we don't want to uh, go into details we do not have. I will stick to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Uh, the secret things belong to God, and the revealed ones belong to us and our children. Mm. I would say that in this uh, act of, of uh, getting a new wife, Abraham extended his family through his six more sons from Keturah. Therefore, other nations would descend from Abraham. As God promised him in Genesis 12, verse 3, the latter part of it, all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you. I see a kind of inclusiveness of that blessing that covers us all, whether we come from a direct lineage or indirect lineage of Abraham, we are going to be blessed. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you very much. So, Sister Sharon, yet still, the promised son, Isaac, and, and these other sons, well, let me rephrase that. Isaac was the promised son, and these other sons were sent away. What's your take on that? You know, um... God had made it clear that the promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac's lineage. So towards the end of um, his life, Abraham appointed Isaac as his legal heir and therefore gave to him most of his property. And, you know, to the sons of Hagar and Keturah, he gave gifts. This, this was to protect Isaac's inheritance. Abraham was a wealthy man and therefore I believe the gifts would have been substantial that he gave to his sons. Mm. He may have been concerned that after his death, the six sons of Keturah, whose mother would likely still have been living, since Keturah seemed to have been considerably younger than Abraham, may have banded together against Isaac, the son of a different mother who had died to try and claim the inheritance for themselves. You know, today we know that open war can break out within families when a relative dies and there is money and property left behind. And this can lead to bitter disputes. Mm. In my mind, Ishmael was brought about by Sarah and Abraham's plan and not by God's plan. And although God said that Ishmael's line would be numerous, I believe had they not interfered with God's plan, there may have been no Ishmael. Mm. Mm. In relation to Keturah, Sarah had died and therefore Abraham was free to remarry. And, I, you know, as Brother Pierre has said, you know, Keturah played an important role in fulfilling God's covenant with Abraham. God did not promise to make Abraham into a great nation. He also um, promised Abraham would be the father of many nations. This promise was fulfilled in part through Keturah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let's take a final comment from our congregation, and it's nice to see in our presence um, Dr. Keith Burton. Those of you that know him from the States, he's definitely over here. It's good to have a comment from you. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, Johnny. Yes, um, as I'm listening, a thought keeps coming to my mind because, you know, when we look at the Bible, the Bible is set in a very patriarchal context, particularly the Old Testament. And I've heard statements about what God wants for Abraham, what God wants for Isaac. It's not good for man to be alone. And I'm wondering how the women in our congregation hear this. Mm. How the older women who may be widows, etc., and how sometimes um, we may apply the Bible in ways that don't necessarily consider mm. the emotional response of others who read the Bible uh, because we're not necessarily taking seriously the sort of male-dominated context mm. in which many of these texts were taken, you know, were, were put together. And so just um, raising an awareness yes. of, you know, seeing things that we normally don't look at mm. and ensuring that they don't influence the way in which we may treat 
the other, whoever the other may be. May it be, whether it be the Muslim, mm. okay? Our, our dear sister over here mentioned how we sometimes apply mm. um, this sort of negative attitude towards Muslims because what we may think about Ishmael. Um, even Hagar, not much is said about Hagar, but Hagar was also a woman of faith. All right, we don't hear a lot about her and a lot of people read her through Galatians, but she was also a woman of faith. But just being sure that even as we read uh, the passages of scripture, that we apply them in a way that doesn't allow us to become some of those androcentric, those male-centered authors who weren't necessarily thinking about the widows mm. and those who may grow old without ever finding a husband. Mm, good point. And good especially point. not a younger husband. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Thank you so much. Our time is far spent. As our panelists prepare their takeaway comments, Pastor, let me take the final. Uh, I don't know if this comment. is a young person or an older person. Excellent point, Dr. Burton. Mm. Praise God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, nice to see you, Dr. Burton. Welcome. Um, um, here's some points um, that I quickly need to just mention. Um, Jennifer Annan says, Sister Smith, I second my thought on our strength, our experience is critical in shaping our lives. God has led us this far, and he will continue to bless us in our older years. Um, uh, Jennifer says, God had told Abraham to count the stars, so he had to keep on procreating. Um, faith in God takes daily in indulgence in his word. In church, there are many single, young, professional women um, who are struggling to find a husband. Rodney says, in my church, a 93-year-old lady, she kept on smiling, and she finally got married. Amen. I'm not, I'm not making a statement for, for the single widowers in my in, in Croydon church, but I would love to do a wedding. Uh, you know, I, I really love doing weddings. Um, it is, sadly, it is still a male-focused world, but Jesus wasn't, Deborah says. Um, if we follow biblical good practice, shouldn't we get involved in choosing our spiritual our, our siblings, our springs, spouses, if we believe in the Bible, um, so, you know, and he's saying both male and female are struggling to attract spouse. Um, and somebody says to Rodney, someday I'm going to visit your church. I want to find one too. So, 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 so. anyway, Elder Johnny, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Keep your comments going on online, although we won't be broadcasting them now. Panelists, let me have your takeaway point. Sister Sharon. Okay, I think my takeaway point is about God's faithfulness. You know, the next time you face a seemingly impossible situation, remember how God has been faithful in the past, that he is faithful for today, and we can trust him to be faithful in the future. Thus, we can act, pray, and cling to his promises. And when you see his faithfulness through answered prayer, worship, and praising. Amen. Thank you. And Brother Pierre. Thank you, Elder Johnny. I would quickly say the value of a promise, more than its content, depends on the maker. God is the only credible promise maker and promise keeper. Children need parents' guidance and blessings in choosing a good partner, which is a precious gift from God. And mm. finally, at any stage of our life, we need someone to lean on. Amen. And Pastor? Abraham like, likely marriage again at the age of... 138 or, or thereabout. Fair to think that marriage is good and it can bring comfort in our old age. He died in good old age, an old man with a young wife. But uh, that's, I'm just reading a comment from online actually. Um, but but do, Dr. Burton made a very powerful point that I just want to amplify in my last thought. But this way, Abraham, even though Isaac was a child of promise, Abraham did not neglect the other children that he had. Notice the Bible says he gave all of his children gifts. And somebody says he was not a poor man, therefore he gave them quite a lot. Mm. And that's a sign of grace. Even though, and I end with this point, even though we, may, we have made a lot of mistakes in our lives, God still gives grace. And the grace that God has given to us we must always be willing to supply grace to those around us who has impacted on us in a negative way. Let us be generous in giving grace. Amen. Thank you, Elder Johnny. Thank you, Pastor. Someone listening today may still be suffering from the impact of a broken 
promise or a broken vow. There is a man who has never broken his promise. His name is Jesus. So let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Next week, by God's grace, Jacob takes center stage. Over to you, Sister Diane. Amen. Thank you to Elder Johnny, thank you to Pastor for leading out, and thank you to all those participants. Um, just a quick announcement for the members. Um, if we could start preparing to, uh, for the ordering of um, the quarterlies um, for the next quarter that be begins in July. Thank you. So um, in closing, I just wanted to share a snippet from Steps um, to Christ, LNG White. I just thought it was very powerful. So the price paid, the price paid for our redemption, the infinite sacrifice of our Heavenly Father in giving his son to die for us, should give us exalted conceptions of what we may become through Christ. As the inspired Apostle John beheld the height, the depth, the breadth of the Father's love toward the perishing race, he was filled with adoration and reverence. And failing to find suitable language in which to express the greatness and tenderness of this love, he called upon the world to behold it. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. What a value this places upon man. Through transgression, the sons of man become subjects of Satan. Through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the sons of, Matt, the sons of Adam may become the sons of God. By assuming human nature, Christ elevates humanity. Fallen men are placed where, through connection with Christ, they may indeed become worthy of the name sons of God. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to study your word. Um, we thank you for your love, Heavenly Father, your grace. Thank you, Lord, um, for inspiring faith within us, Lord. I pray that we would continually choose you, Lord, um, and that you would help us with our weaknesses and where we struggle, Lord. I pray that you would lead us and guide us, um, and I pray that we would choose to be led by you and choose to be guided by you, Lord, um, because ultimately, it is a choice that we have to make, and I pray that that choice would be you, Heavenly Father. So please be with us now. Please, please be with us in the duration of the service. I pray um, that everyone is blessed, and I pray all goes according to your perfect will and plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.